Well, thank you very much for being here this evening. It's a pleasure to have uh, our distinguished guest with us, my good friend Patrick Kennedy from Rhode Island. As I've said many times before, as we traveled the country to 14 states, 14 field hearings to promote the mental health parity legislation, were Patrick's Kennedy, Patrick Kennedy's uncle, President Kennedy, still alive and were he to write a sequel to his book, Profiles in Courage, there's no question at all that his nephew Patrick would occupy a full chapter. Thank you, Patrick, for your courage in, uh, in uh, being so honest to the nation about the disease that we suffer together and uh, for being such a good friend to so many Americans. Uh, I'm uh, very privileged to be uh, one of six resident fellows this semester at uh, the Institute of Politics. Uh, it's a wonderful experience uh, with tremendous people, all of you. And uh, for the previous 28 years, I served uh, in elective office, uh, 10 years as a Minnesota State Senator, and the last uh, uh, 18 as a member of, of Congress. And uh, I can honestly say that uh, my uh, co-sponsor on the mental health parity legislation, uh, the chief sponsor in the end, uh, is also my best friend in the House of Representatives and one of my best friends in life, my Patrick Kennedy. For me, uh, for 80 million other Americans, for Patrick, the issue we're about to discuss tonight is not just another public policy issue. It's a matter of life or death. On July 31st of 1981, I woke up in a jail cell in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, under arrest for disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, and failure to vacate the premises. Not exactly the kind of publicity I was seeking at the end of my first year of my first term as a young state senator. Not the kind of front page newspaper coverage I wanted, not the kind of lead television news coverage I wanted. I figured it was not only the end of my political career, but it might as well be the end of my life. But instead, that was a turning point in my life, only because I had access to treatment. I had access to treatment. Something 300,000 Americans last year didn't have. They were ready to seek help. They were ready to seek help for their mental illness or addiction. But the treatment doors were slammed shut on them because insurance companies, for the most part, would not cover their malady, be it a mental illness or an addiction to alcohol and or drugs. Last year alone, 54 million Americans, according to the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, suffered from mental illness. 26 million Americans suffering out there tonight from chemical addiction. 35,000 suicides in this country last year from untreated depression. 180,000 people died as a direct result of their untreated addiction. And of course, the cost to our gross domestic product is staggering, estimated by the Wall Street Journal to be $400 billion. The cost of untreated depression alone, estimated to be $70 billion. And who can measure the human suffering, the cost of broken families, the cost of educational failures, of shattered dreams, destroyed lives, destroyed relationships, and what's been the response to this public health crisis? What we believe is America's number one public health problem. Over the last eight years, it's certainly been woefully inadequate. As far as addiction is concerned, in a, two words, it can be described as crop eradication. We spent millions and millions of dollars spraying opium poppies in Colombia and other countries in Latin America. And what's been the result? I think Richard Holbrook, Dick Holbrook, puts it best. Uh, you'll remember uh, uh, Ambassador Holbrook, uh, who served as ambassador to the United Nations and now is serving President Obama, 
and the country as uh, envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Dick Holbrook put it very succinctly when he said, our policy of eradication has been the single most ineffective program in American foreign policy history. The single most ineffective program in American foreign policy history. Meanwhile, what's happening to treatment in America? Over the last decade, 50% of the treatment beds have disappeared. They're gone. Even more alarming, 60% of the adolescent treatment beds are gone. They've disappeared. I'll never forget a visit that I made along with, at the invitation of President Clinton, uh, three other uh, House colleagues, uh, a visit to Mexico to confer with then President Zadeo. And I'll never forget President Zadeo telling our delegation, including President Clinton, that the Mexican government will never be able to adequately address the supply side of the drug problem, drugs coming from Colombia and other parts uh, south of Mexico, through Mexico into the United States. They will never satisfactorily address the supply side of the problem until we Americans address our in insatiable demand for drugs. And that's a direct quote from President Zadeo. Never will we be able to address the supply side of the problem until you Americans address your insatiable demand for drugs. Richard Nixon, War on Drugs, 1971. I don't like the metaphor, but uh, that's what it's, uh, uh, that's what Richard Nixon called it, and that's what it's come to be known as. He dedicated 60% of the funding to prevention, treatment, and education. The demand side, Richard Nixon. Today, we're spending about 30% on treatment, prevention, and education, and only 70% on the supply side. And as most of you know, given the statistics and the terrible uh, situation in this country, the drug epidemic, if you will, it's not working. And the main problem is a lack, lack of access to treatment. We're not dedicating enough resources to prevention and education. Uh, that uh, succinctly stated, I think, is the major problem. Well, our guest speaker, whom I'm, I'm about to introduce, he and I have fought a 12-year battle to end the discrimination by insurance companies against people with mental illness and or chemical addiction. We uh, have traveled this country far and wide, as I mentioned earlier, 14 states to build grassroots support for the Paul Wellstone Mental Health Equity and Addiction Treatment Parity Bill, which finally, finally, after 12 years of work, was signed into law on October 3rd of 2008. Certainly, uh, as, well, as the uh, New York Times called it, a major step forward regarding access, uh, historic landmark legislation. And uh, I give my friend and colleague, Patrick Kennedy, a great deal of credit for the impetus he provided and the leadership he uh, provided uh, on this uh, life-saving legislation. But let me just, to, before I introduce Patrick, say a few more things about uh, the current situation. This legislation, it's important to point out, only applies to people in health plans. Of the 26 million addicts uh, in America out there tonight, roughly 16 million have health insurance. 10 million do not. They're either uh, covered by Medicaid or not covered at all as part of the 47 million Americans with no health insurance. Our Medicare seniors, the incidence of alcoholism and depression among seniors is increasing at an alarming rate. Medicaid is underfunded. Our troops and veterans, uh, this really hit home uh, as far as uh, Minnesotans are concerned when Lance Corporal Jonathan Schultze from Chaska, Minnesota returned from his second tour of duty in Iraq, suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, depression, and alcoholism. He and his parents went to the VA to seek help to seek inpatient treatment, and were told that he was number 26 on the waiting list and would get a call in about four or five months. Well, four days later, Lance Corporal Schultze was found hanging from an electric cord in his apartment, a victim of suicide from his untreated diseases. 
And that's happening every single day in the United States of America. Also, our prisoners. We're not treating our prisoners. The underlying cause of most criminality in this country, the Center for Addiction and Center for Substance Abuse and Addiction Studies at Columbia University found after an exhaustive study that 82% of all prisoners in our jails and prisons are there directly or indirectly because of drugs and or alcohol or some form of mental illness. And of course, the stigma, which my friend will talk about uh, tonight, is uh, very, very pronounced still in the 21st century toward these diseases of the brain. What we're advocating, simply stated, and what we started uh, with our crusade for parity, is an effort to have diseases of the brain treated the same as diseases of the body. Uh, and treatment uh, of these diseases, mental illness and chemical dependency, not only is treatment for these diseases the right thing to do, but it's also the cost-effective thing to do, as all the empirical data show. The National Institute on Drug Abuse study, every dollar we spend on treatment saves $12 in health care and criminal justice costs alone. The average untreated alcoholic or addict out there tonight incurs health care costs that are 100% higher than mine or my friend and colleagues, those of us who have been fortunate enough to have access to treatment and who have been treated for our addiction. All the empirical data, all the actuarial studies show savings of billions of dollars if we were to treat more Americans suffering the ravages of chemical addiction and mental illness. Well, let me just conclude by saying it's in our judgment, it's time for Congress and the President to treat these diseases as the, fed, as the fatal and progressive diseases they are. It's time to treat diseases of the brain the same as diseases of the body. And uh, to uh, speak on that subject, nobody, in my judgment, is more articulate nor more passionate than our guest here tonight. Patrick Kennedy has represented the first district of Rhode Island since 1995, where he lives in the city of Portsmouth. Representative Kennedy was also the youngest member of the Kennedy family to hold political office when he was elected to the Rhode Island General Assembly at age 21, two and a half years before graduating from Providence College. Patrick currently serves on the House Appropriations Committee, where he's a member of the subcommittees on Labor, Health, and Human Services, and Education and Commerce, Justice, and Science. In democratic politics, Patrick is already, like other members of his family, legendary, and I say that somewhat begrudgingly as a Republican, albeit a very moderate one, but Patrick uh, has, been, has experienced unbelievable success uh, as uh, chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. And uh, of course, uh, his influence and his father's influence uh, has uh, uh, been described as, uh, as, as pivotal in their su early support for President Obama during the primary campaign. I came to know Patrick, to really know him as a friend and colleague, uh, when we started working together on the Paul Wellstone Mental health uh, legislation, mental health parity legislation. And it's wonderful to have him here today uh, at this institution that bears his family name. So please help me in welcoming my friend, our friend and my colleague, Congressman Patrick Kennedy. <laughs> Love you, man. <laughs> Was that good enough? <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Um, Thank you all for being here this evening. Indeed, it's a great honor for me to come to an institution that bears my uncle's name. Um, I lived my whole life um, with the great honor of carrying on his family name and legacy. And uh, for me to come to the institution that uh, he got his education in and that continues his work and instills his values is a great honor for me. Um, when I think uh, Jim Ramstead, uh, I think of the 
picture in Jim Ramstead's office of him at Boy State when he uh, went along with then uh, another Boy State member, Bill Clinton, um, to visit President Kennedy in 1963 and um, to see the impact that President Kennedy had on a whole generation of young people um, then to inspire them into going into public service um, and to see that service continue uh, in Jim Ramstead through his state senate career and then through his many years in the Congress and now of all places to come to the place that bears his name. What a fitting tribute uh, to President Kennedy that that young man who was in Boy State then is now here in the institution that bears his name, keeping on the legacy that he was so inspired by when he first met President Kennedy. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and I will tell you, um, you inspire me because uh, when I was growing up, you know, I often thought of you know my family's legacy and historical terms. And uh, when I even got to the Congress, uh, you know, a lot of people were thinking of things as already having been done in terms of the great social movements towards civil rights and um, equal rights. And one of the greatest movements of civil rights and equal rights of our time was a campaign for mental health parity that was being waged by Jim Ramstead before I even got to the Congress. And it was a, a very lonely struggle being waged uh, on the Republican side of the aisle. Uh, when I got to the Congress, I was looking around to sponsor a mental health parity bill, and uh, you know, the way bills get sponsored in the Congress, the most senior member gets to sponsor the bill. And usually it goes down the order of you know, seniority. Well, it tells you about how popular mental health parity was that as a freshman member at 27 from the smallest state in the country in the minority party, I got to be the main sponsor of mental health parity in 1994. And I got to be co-sponsor with Jim Ramstead, uh, which tells you how popular he was at the time, too. <laughs> but uh, the great thing about it was, you know, Jim was leading the charge on a very revolutionary bill, and revolutionary in the minds of many in the mental health community. And that was that it was a bill that covered all mental illnesses. Oh my God, that's so far-fetched. It was, it was very far-fetched. Because the mental health community, even back then, thought, you know, we can cover the biologically-based mental illnesses, but God forbid we add and cover, you know, those addicts and alcoholics, you know, they'll sink us. You know, politically, they are just like lepers. You know, we include them in the coverage. There's no way we're going to make any headway whatsoever. So frankly, in, it was the only bill in either chamber that was comprehensive. And it was being led by Jim Ramstead. And that was the point of departure from which we took off to lead the way on a mental health parity bill that eventually brought what was to become a Senate parity bill much closer to an, a more comprehensive parity bill in the very final end product, uh, closer to the one that I think most Americans wanted at the, the final result. If we had started from the starting point uh, that was begun by what the insurance companies and the insurance lobby would have had us take, we would have ended up in a very, very different end result. And um, my friends, that would not have been an enviable position for most in the mental health community because we would have actually have gone backward 
in most places in this country because the, the um, initial Senate bill uh, called for us to preempt state law for mental health benefits when state law in many cases was much further along than what was being called for in the Senate bill. So we would actually be going backward instead of forward on mental health parity when ostensibly the name of the bill was mental health parity. We'd actually be going backwards on it. And if we hadn't had Jim Ramstead setting the benchmark at the get-go as to this is what the bill is, and there we're standing firm on this, we wouldn't have had the place to start off where we were going to bargain from the position of strength on principle. And, uh, and that was the position that ultimately, frankly, the Senate bill came much more closer to where our bill was than we ever went towards the Senate bill. And I give a great deal of credit to Jim for the fact that that's where we started and that's where we ultimately ended up closer to because of the fact that we started there. Um, so when I think of the fact that I'm in this building named after my uncle and I think that today Barack Obama is President of the United States and I think that the single greatest civil rights battle that occurred during President Kennedy's tenure in office occurred as he led the fight for civil rights in our country. And he gave that great speech on civil rights where he spoke to the nation, first time an American president ever addressed this nation on the issue of race relations. And he said, who amongst us would want to be treated in a way like a person with the color of the skin as this person would have and trade places with that person in this country. And frankly, that was the moral test of our society, he said. It was the golden rule of, of our country is whether if it was good enough for someone else and it was good enough for us, it should be good enough for someone else. And he put that moral standard to, to our country in a state of this country's address. And that was the big speech that he made that laid the foundation for the 65 Civil Rights Act. And today we have a uh, President of the United States uh, who has broken the, the ceiling on, on race relations. And we still have a great deal of uh, further to go in this country, but what a distance we've come. And I hope that uh, we can make the kind of difference and ground that we've made in race relations over these many years and the years to come on uh, uh, parity and mental health um, integration in our health care system. And I hope we can make it in a shorter amount of time than it did take us to, to make ground in race relations. Because frankly, we still have bigotry and stereotype guiding um, the treatment of those with mental health disorders. And the impact of that on our society uh, has been outlined, uh, as Jim Ramstead said, in so, so many graphic ways. I have a, a small slide presentation I'd like to um, unveil that will take us through the shocking uh, statistics, once again, of uh, these numbers and highlight to everybody that this is really the great elephant in the room in our American society. And if we could, I suppose, dim the lights and turn on the projector. <clears throat> Here, as you see, that uh, approximately 80% of all people in the United States with a mental health disorder eventually seek treatment at some point in their lives. The delay in all disorders is nearly a decade. And less than one-third of people who seek help receive minimally adequate care. The, the delay in evidence-based medicine getting to people is enormous. As Jim identified, the impact of behavioral disorders illustrated suicide is the leading cause of violent deaths worldwide. Everybody's shocked when I tell them that in our country, suicide 
is uh, nearly twice what homicide is. Nearly twice what homicide is. We see, um, we see uh, in our country homicides every night on the news. And we see it displayed on the top of our TV screens. And they see it on the cover of our newspapers. But do you ever see the suicides? Do you ever read about it? No. Why not? Why not? They're taking our people's lives. They're taking our kids' lives. It's the second leading cause of death for those 15 to 35. We have 1,100 college students going to take their lives this year alone. When we lay out all the backpacks of those who successfully take their lives on college campuses this year alone, they're going to cover most of the mall from Capitol Hill up to 17th Street, like the AIDS quilt did with the AIDS epidemic. Suicide is an epidemic. When we, when we went around the country, Jim and I, with hearings on mental health parity, we had parents come in with books that looked like 9x yellow pages, full of obituaries. And what read like a simple obituary, they took us through and showed us this wasn't an obituary, this was a suicide. It was something that startled us and should act as a wake-up call to the rest of the country. And the person in the United States, a person takes his or her life approximately every 16 minutes. That's the ones we know of. That doesn't count the people who run their car into a telephone pole because they're inebriated. That doesn't count the number of people um, who the army is still trying to ascertain have committed suicide. The, the last uh, month, they registered um, 24 suicides versus 18 killed in Iraq. That didn't even cover the veterans. The implication there were those were people that, uh, of all service people, didn't even include the veterans with that statistic. People with serious mental illness serving in the public uh, system are dying in an average 25 years early. So that is the problem. This is a, a real issue where because of their mental illness, they, they have a complication of uh, preventable health complications and they, their mortality is 25 years earlier. Consequences of untreated mental illness. Depressed children are more likely to perform poorly in the classroom, engage in aggressive behavior, and have poor peer and teacher relationships. We don't even have good outreach to the children of our veterans. We have secondary post-traumatic stress disorder in this country. We have our soldiers gone for two, three tours of duty and we wonder why their children are acting up and acting out and getting suspended from school. Do you think it's not an obligation of our country to make sure that those schools are adequately prepared to address the needs of those children of our Guard and Reservists? Aren't they part of the total family? Aren't they part of our nation's um, military and thus part of our obligation to take care of them for the incidents of suffering that they are uh, traumatically going through because of their parents being called away to serve their country so much. I think so and we should address it and yet we're not because they're not covered as quote beneficiaries under the definition of veterans beneficiary in the VA. Children with depression and anxiety uh, disorders are more likely uh, to miss school and subsequently drop out. And uh, this is a, an issue that we should look at because we've seen studies called acute 
childhood experiences, ACE studies, that show that children who are experiencing um, childhoods where there's violence, where a parent is violent, um, uh, domestic violence in home, where their mother is, um, has an addiction or alcoholism, uh, whether uh, they have uh, some kind of uh, severe poverty at home where they live in an inner city and there's violence in the, in the um, city. These children are experiencing really post-traumatic stress disorder. They're living in a war zone. I mean, what is to differentiate children growing up when they see their father slap their mother across the room or they see their mother stumble across totally inebriated, what is to distinguish those children's coping mechanisms and ability to survive uh, from a soldier who actually is an adult and has some coping mechanisms being in theater in a war? At least the adult has something to uh, fall back on in terms of coping mechanisms. Those children have nothing. And you know what happens? They are at much, much higher risk for suicide. They are at much, much higher risk for health care problems dropping out of school, and um, ending up in the juvenile justice system and the prison system. 50% of the children in our foster care system end up in prison. 50%. Period. And those are kids that are in our custody. Those are our children as a society. Those are our kids. I mean, if we start anywhere, we better start with the kids that we actually own. And that's not a pretty good statistic in terms of the kids that are actually our children in, as a society, as a government. Children with anxiety disorders are more likely to have poor occupational attainment. Very expensive, poor outcomes. U.S. citizens spent $5 per capita for health care, 53% more than any other country. Not a big surprise that we as a country have uh, the most costly system in the world, we spend four times uh, what most other industrialized nations spend on health care, um, and yet we're ranking at the bottom of most industrialized countries in terms of satisfaction rates. And not only ha satisfaction rates, but look at where we rank in terms of industrialized na nations in terms of health indicators. Absolutely outrageous in terms of uh, health indicators. We have a sick care system, not a health care system. And as Jim said, we have a prison industry that has criminalized uh, a health epidemic. Now here is health care costs add absenteeism to it. Now add short-term disability. Now add presenteeism. You can see that as a, a burden of illness, and those are lost days of productivity in our society where people just can't function. They might be going to work, but they can't focus on their work. Um, and therefore, it's a loss to our economy. Mental illness ranks at the top. And so as a uh, area of concern, it would, it would stand to reason that we should be spending as much money on mental illness as we're spending on, you know, hypertension, heart disease. Look at what, where cancer ranks. I mean, not for nothing. However, as you all can suspect, mental illness, we spend a fraction of the dollars on mental illness as we spend arthritis, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, or hypertension, either one of those. We spend a fraction of the dollars on any one of those on mental illness. And look at how much it occupies in terms of a, a priority in our, our health care system. Other chronic diseases. Mental health and mental illness, look at where it ranks. It's just to point out that we don't have our priorities straight in terms of where this 
should be in terms of a focus of our public health system. And as Jim pointed out, the correlation between mental illness and other illnesses, there is a correlation between the two. If you have a mental illness, you're twice as likely to have a heart attack, twice as likely to have diabetes. You are, you know, the, it, it just exponentially um, exacerbates other problems that you might have. Asthma, I mean, sp speaking from personal um, experience, uh, it just complicates everything else that you may have. So by treating um, a mental illness, you treat everything else in the body. There we go. So now we prepare to answer your many questions. Thank you very much. Good job, buddy. Good timing, too. Good timing. I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Madras to say a few words. She is former uh, head of the uh, National Drug Thank Control you. Policy. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much. I'm the former uh, director, deputy director for demand reduction in the uh, White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and I've just returned back to my position at Harvard. I have about, uh, perhaps I could have a few comments and then yes, questions. Yes, please, absolutely. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here and to see two of my major heroes in Congress uh, addressing this audience. There are so many issues that we have to reform with regard to substance abuse and mental health services, and I think this is an opportune time for ev everyone to re-engage in the issue. I fully agree with you, Congressman Randstad, that uh, the, um, the, the, the ratio of supply versus demand has been a very difficult one to accept, especially from the perspective that I have. We need a public health policy approach to this issue. But there are many things that I think perhaps some of our population are unaware of. First and foremost is the difficulty I had with Congress because we put in three years in a row to um, increase the budget for drug courts which offer convicted felons who are nonviolent a choice of treatment or jail. And drug courts have data outcome measures that are astonishingly good. We asked for $69 million for three years in a row. Congress allocated 10. And we kept on pushing until finally we gave up and said, the drug court judges have to go and help us educate our congressmen because we've done everything we possibly could. The second issue that Congress failed us on was ESBERT, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment, which Congressman Kennedy and, and Ramstead are, are champions of. And this is designed to, f is, is, is what I consider a perfect convergence of prevention, intervention, and treatment in one program. It is designed to identify people with substance abuse problems in the medical system and then provide them interventions uh, within that medical system because about 80% of our population sees a physician at least um, once a year. The problem here is that when I try to get money from Congress for training of physicians in this program, OMB agreed to a $56 million budget, and Congress allocated essentially $3.75 million for the training. It makes no sense. Access to recovery was another example where the president asked for, in his State of the Union address, $1.5 billion to close the treatment gap, and Congress allocated a hundred million each year. So the problem is not only the leadership, the problem is educating congressmen on the, on, 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 on the necessities for this. But let me go into a few more questions. The UPPL laws, for example. 
why don't we have a federal lead on them? Because these laws prevent, in some states, physicians from asking if a person is there because of an alcohol or substance abuse problem. Because if they ask and they receive a positive response, they can't get reimbursed. The UPPL laws have to be repealed in every state. And we do, we've only made a very small headway in that. So I, I submit to you that there are many issues that we ha still have to reform. And we have to reform treatment as well. Because I think the treatment in our country, there are 14,000 treatment centers in the country, and I would say less than half, achieve a moderate level of standards, a moderate level that would be acceptable in a medical community. They don't have HIV counseling. They don't have psychiatric services. How can a person who's comorbid for mental health problems and substance abuse be evaluated if there's no resident psychiatrist on board? There are so many issues that need reform, and I hope that the next Congress, the next administration, and for generations to come, we will improve and get better and better. Thank you very much, Doctor, uh, for, for that uh, very... Uh very impressive presentation, and more importantly, thanks for the work you did on the demand side reduction. Uh, you tried, and there's no question it's a bipartisan problem. Uh, I had high hopes, quite frankly, for the Clinton administration. I thought, uh, you know, with Barry McCaffrey advocating uh, reversing the priorities or, or at least uh, equalizing the, the demand and, and supply side uh, resources, I thought uh, we would uh, make some progress. We didn't. Uh, and, and it seems like, as I said, this is a, well, I know we know firsthand, Patrick and I have fought uh, both sides. It really is a bipartisan, I hate to use the term ignorance, it's more, there, there are a number of factors that go, it's not a high priority, bottom line. Uh, dealing with mental health and uh, addiction problems is not a high priority. That's why Patrick and I, to educate other members and to make it a higher priority, founded the Addiction Treatment and Recovery Caucus. The sole purpose was to educate other members, uh, bring in people like you and Barry McCaffrey and other experts in the field. Well, you know, we held a number of hearings each year uh, since the caucus was established. Very rarely would any members come. They'd send their staff, and uh, I'm not sure how successful we were. But we have an education job to do, not only uh, on the vis-a-vis -vis the body politic, the people of this country, but with the Congress, their representatives in Washington. And the priorities reflect what the people back home are, are urging in terms of funding and, uh, and uh, attention. And unfortunately, the problems we're <coughs> primarily interested in, mental health and addiction problems, aren't getting the attention uh, nor the, the priority in funding. Can I ask? Uh my, uh, one of my constituents, uh, to say a few words about this subject, uh, not be, just because I'm being a good politician and all politics is local and I want his vote in the he next election. He thinks he's election. the master of ceremonies here tonight. Uh, but this is where it's all at, and that is it's in the politics, and that's what we're here about. That's what President Kennedy was saying, is about people getting involved and why they need to be active. You know, part of the problem, the biggest problem is that, you know, everybody in recovery is mostly involved in this anonymity uh, self-help group. Well, they mistake that to mean that they're not supposed to do anything in the public realm. Uh, well, you know, part of that means that the shame and the stigma continues because everybody's under wraps. And so it's just... but. In addition to that, no one goes out and lobbies because they think, oh, that's against our tradition of anonymity. Well, that cuts out the whole advocacy community, the very people who you want to get up there to say, hey, I benefited from recovery, and you know what? I need you, and I'm going to hold you accountable for if you don't vote the right way, I'm going to vote you out of office next time, you know? 
those people aren't up there knocking on the doors the way the NRA folks are, you know, you're not going to get the results. And you know what? Like every other constituent group, the members of Congress aren't hearing it. And they're not feeling the heat. So who's out there? There's a group called uh, Family and Faces and Voices of Recovery. And Faces and Voices of Recovery are putting a, uh, you know, face and voice on recovery and saying, you know, this is a political movement, too, and we want to um, speak out. So Tom, maybe tell you a little bit about what he's been doing around the country, trying to get consumers activated around the country. Could you talk, Tom, for a second? Please, Tom. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Congressman, and, uh, and thanks for the excellent presentation, uh, Congressman Ramstead and Congressman Kennedy. Uh, my name's Tom Coderre, and I'm uh, a face and voice for recovery, I guess. I'm a person in long-term recovery, which means I haven't used alcohol or drugs since May 2003. And uh, as a result of not using alcohol and other drugs, guess what? My life has gotten better. I've been able to uh, improve relationships with my family, my friends. I'm employable again. Uh, I'm one of those people... Uh, that uh, didn't get caught up in those statistics that you were talking about, Congressman. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, there's far too many people who don't put a face and voice on recovery for some reason. They don't think they can. And the courage uh, that Congressman Kennedy has shown, the courage that Congressman Ramstead has shown, and millions of other Americans out there who have been willing to speak out publicly about their addiction and not just their addiction, but we got to remember the other side, their recovery. Uh, has really is really what will drive this debate uh, we believe into the future and we're seeing uh, a lot of progress there's a lot more advocates there were today than there they are there's a lot more advocates today than there were 10 years ago or five years ago or three years ago and it's growing uh, as time goes on and if people want to learn more about how to get involved they can go to the faces and voices of recovery website www.facesandvoicesofrecovery.org but one of the things that we've done is not only support uh, the Mental Health and Addiction uh, Equity Act that passed through Congress last year, but supported, we support a whole host of other types of issues, like making sure that people have access to recovery support services. Because a lot of times you hear that people need access to treatment, but what really people need access to is when they leave treatment, they need to have access to recovery support services. I've uh, traveled around the country for the past two years as the National Field Director for Faces and Voices of Recovery, a job which I love dearly, and I just left in December to take, a, to take another position back in state government of Rhode Island. Uh, I'm a former state senator, and uh, I had the, uh, uh, some, some of the same kinds of story, uh, stories that I could tell about my addiction uh, that Congressman Ramstead told when he shared uh, some of his story. Uh, and I think what's happening is you're seeing a lot of people in recovery who come from all walks of life. Um, addiction is an equal opportunity disease, just like any other disease. It does not discriminate. Anyone can get it. And what happens is, is when you suffer from it, uh, you really uh, you lose all the things that are important to you in life. And by finding recovery, you can regain all those things. And I think what we've done uh, at Faces and Voices of Recovery is given people an opportunity to come together uh, as citizens and rally in, in Washington and in Congress, and that's what we're trying to do. So we ask people to get involved, uh, you know, join us, uh, because that's how this movement's going to grow. That's how we're going to uh, really address some of the things that, uh, that the, doc the good doctor talked about when she got up. So and it, just explain on the state level, too. Sure. How Faces and Voices is organized, we're organized nationally, so we have a national organization, but in every state, uh, there are statewide chapters and local chapters. So you can get involved right here in Massachusetts. They have the Massachusetts Organization for Addiction Recovery, MORE, uh, is here in Massachusetts. And people can join their MORE chapter. They can get involved and do advocacy work here at the, at the state capitol. Uh, they can educate members of Congress uh, from their state through that uh, project. Uh, and they can educate the public because, as Congressman Ramstead so eloquently put it, politicians really pay attention to what their constituents have to say. And if constituents aren't telling their congressmen that this is an important issue, then the, then the congressmen are not going to be able to raise this to the level where it needs to be when they have a, uh, when they have a debate like they just had on the stimulus bill, where they uh, appropriated hundreds of millions of dollars, and very, very little of it went to addiction and recovery support services. Yeah. When we know 
that that's what's going to help people. We know that that's what's going to reduce recidivism in our prisons. We know that's what's going to make our communities healthier. So we need to do a lot more work. But it's, it's by putting a face and voice on recovery, telling your recovery story out there, and getting uh, family members and friends of people in recovery. I have, I have a family. I have lots of friends. They care about me. They cared about me when I was going through my addiction. They care even more now that I'm in recovery. We need to tell those stories so that we can rise this to the level that it needs to be risen. Thanks. And, and just Thanks, one Tom. more thing, Tom. Uh -oh. <laughs> this, this is really oh important. Oh, I mean, he's wait. on. He's he, he coaches the, these groups on what to say on the, how on the radio, the statistics <laughs> and the facts, and sure. making sure the groups out there know their stuff so that they're on the radio when misinformation is out there. Right. They can call up to the talk shows and dispute it. You know, because we know the media just gloms on to the myth and the stereotype. We've got to just jump on that, and that's why these also, groups are Also, going. his group generated 80,000 calls in one week to the speaker's office. Bring up parity. <laughs> bring up parity. <laughs> yeah. Close down the switchboards. Before I go to my fellow sure. fellow here, my colleague Teresa, I want to thank you. Thank you're Jeff welcome. Blodgett. Thank Pat Taylor. Thank everybody yeah. else at Faces and Voices, because you're doing just that. Great. And, and, and thanks to people like Patrick Kennedy, his cousin Christopher Lawford, People like Betty Ford, former first lady, people yeah. like Mercury Morris and Daryl Strawberry, people who are celebrities well known, who have had the guts to come yeah. forward and talk about That's their addiction important. and more importantly their recovery. We are making some progress. We so are. please keep up the good we work will. of faces and voices. Teresa, Thanks, you're on. <laughs> thank you very much, Tom. Um, I just first of all want to say thank you for both of you being here and for your honesty. I think it's great. I also think it's great for the issue. Um, I'm originally from the Midwest and if it were this weather we'd still have three times the amount of people here. So Congressman, this is not that people do not care about you. You know this, this is part of the country. They got a little freaked out with the <laughs> snow. Um, but my big question is, I, great victory, this piece of legislation. And so I was wondering if you could give us some lessons learned about when you ran around the country and the campaign right. for this piece of legislation, what you learned, what you'd do again, what you w um, wouldn't do. But for those people that are still trying to figure out how to make this issue important, because we're all one degree of separation from it, if not less. I just think it would be helpful if we could get a little smarter about what you learned. Right. Um, well, I, I mean, as Dr. Martin Luther King said, uh, we are all caught in an inescapable web of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. And where there's injustice anywhere, there's a threat to justice everywhere. I mean, this is the, the issue, you know. It's in every family, every community, everywhere in America. And, and it affects every facet of life, business, health care, everything. And the whole point of our doing our parity hearings was that it brought it home in, in a human element that was just impossible to ignore. And the, the parity hearings were riveting because there's nothing that, you know, America gets more riveted by than Oprah and Dr. Phil, you know, because it's the connection to the human story. I mean, we can't get statistics in this country. You know, we're lost when we're in the trillions and the billions and the millions of dollars. And the, the statistics of a, millions of kids starving in Darfur and people, mass genocide and everything else. But you give us one orphan, you know, one kid, one family, and America stands transfixed. You know, they, their heart will go out to them. And the key is we've got to personalize this issue around, you know, that individual family and, you know, capture it in those emotional, you know, f terms that everybody can relate to because everybody's in that same situation. And, that's why those hearings were so, so uh, important and why uh, you know, Faces and Voices of Recovery is so important because they have hearings on uh, every state legislature every year on the budget. And when those families come in there and have pictures of their children and, and talk about how because there wasn't adequate funding for them to go to residential rehab, you know, they're no longer able to, they're, no, they're not s s survivors any longer because of medical necessity determination. This is where it's really at. They got denied treatment for their illness. I mean, that just, forget about it. And uh, uh, that's where you have to have it. I mean, 
we need to rally people and have those kinds of forums where people can really get connected to the human suffering. It's real human suffering, and that's what it's all about. If I may expand just briefly, one story brought it home. Most compelling uh, witness of those 14 hearings was a guy named Steve from Arizona testified at our hearing in Los Angeles. How he woke up one morning when he was still in high school and he felt a stinging sensation in his back. And he reached back and he brought forward a, a handful of blood and he couldn't understand and he stumbled into the kitchen right off uh, his bedroom. And just as, as he reached the kitchen table to sit down, his mother came around the corner with a gun, telling Steve that his sister is already in heaven, and now the mother said, you and I, Steve, are going to join your sister in heaven. Steve pleaded with his mother, mother, put the gun down. Mom, put the gun down. Please put the gun down. She finally put the gun down. Steve, uh, uh, because of that gunshot in his lower back, I became a paraplegic, but like Steve put it at that hearing, he said, it wasn't my mother who caused me to be a person with paraplegia, to be a paraplegic. It was the insurance company because my mother was schizophrenic and they had cut off her meds. They had cut off her meds. That brought home the need for parity. Please. Um. My name is David Holden. I'm a mid-career student this year. I want to thank you gentlemen both for your work. Uh, I had the opportunity today to share my experience, strength, and hope with a classmate who was concerned about a family member who was suffering from untreated alcoholism. And I was struck by two things. One was her love and her care for her member of her family was suffering. But secondly, by the, the total ignorance she had about the disease of alcoholism and addiction. And this is an intelligent, well-educated Harvard student from an intelligent, well-educated, and successful family, and they are at their wit's end about how to help their, their loved one. And I guess my question is, how do we build education into the effort that you gentlemen have started? How does that work in for people who are not directly affected, but as we all know, so many of our classmates and friends and loved ones are? Well, Dr. Madras just said it really brilliantly. In our healthcare system, our Medical professionals don't have a clue, not a clue. And, and albeit, you know, they, they're in a modern era and they know how to, quote, talk the mental health rap, they don't get it, okay? We need to have medical boards that test, um, you know, providers on this as an illness and, uh, you know, on the whole issue of, as the doctor said, on screening, brief intervention, and treatment. And, uh, and so that, you know, because when you have your physician start at, a, at the beginning of your life treating this as like, like it was diabetes, like it was blood tests, like you're taking a urine sample, like you're taking a blood test, like you're getting an x-ray, all of a sudden, okay, yeah, of course. But if this is being treated like your, mental, your health care is here, but your mental health care is over there, of course you're going to have stigma, you know, of course you're going to have misunderstandings, and of course you're going to be like in yourself, treating it like it's something else. I mean, that's the way our, you know, even our government, our SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, puts money for mental health here and substance abuse here. Neither the tw two shall meet. So if you get uh, screened at a community health center for an addiction to get treatment, you've got to go over to the other side of town to get treated because the one center can't get reimbursed under the federal guidelines. Also, we've got to prioritize education and prevention, as a good doctor pointed out. The funding just hasn't been there. But just let me say this for anybody who might be watching or anybody in the audience here tonight, if First of all, if people, if you aren't impacted directly, I understand the ignorance. I mean, people just don't have a general knowledge, understanding, general lay people, let alone physicians, because it's not being taught in medical schools for the most part. But um, if a person is struggling or a family member, a loved one is struggling, every town and city in America big enough to have yellow pages have listing under Alcoholics Anonymous, under AA, and that's the place to start if you don't 
know of a treatment center or know of an intervention specialist or some other doctor who's, who knows how to treat uh, addiction or, or professional uh, uh, treatment person. So that's the place where I advise people who are just out there frustrated beyond belief, especially in small town America. Like I said, every town big enough to have yellow pages generally has a listing for Alcoholics Anonymous and they will always be there to help. And uh, Patrick and I are, are two people, neither one of us uh, on our own breached our anonymity. Uh, we both had law enforcement uh, doing that for us. <laughs> but instead of being a curse, which I thought it was at the time, I was embarrassed beyond belief and uh, really wanted to be dead. I didn't want to face anybody. I was so humiliated. And, uh, but instead of, uh, uh, well, let me just say this. I went back and I thanked the media years later because they, I think, saved my life without seeing that, without their intervention. Some people have intervention by family members, some by business uh, superiors, some by uh, uh, teachers. Uh, well, I'm just grateful that I had my intervention uh, by the Sioux Falls Police Department in South Dakota. And let me just say again, you can't look at someone who's suffering from um, a chemical addiction and think that they're exhibiting that behavior voluntarily, like that they are, you know, voluntarily putting themselves through the consequences that they're putting themselves through because they want to. I mean, like that this is all a life that they've chosen for themselves, that this is all voluntary choice. Yeah, and they, you know, and I just, anybody who's lived with it personally or seen a family member live with it, they can't, you've got to step back and rationally think, is this something that actually someone would want to choose for themselves? And if they can honestly say, oh yeah, that's something they really want for themselves in their life, I mean, then that's a, I doubt they can say that. That's a pretty good distinguishing characteristic. Hi, gentlemen. William, I'm with um, the Congressman's study group. Um, one thing you mentioned was um, basically the secondary effects of post-traumatic stress. And I really thought about that a lot. The children that are caught up in, in fathers coming home or, or, or loved ones coming home. If you could expound on that a little bit and uh, actually kind of give me a little bit of an idea, but it's kind of premature to go through too much of it, kind of in the fundraising, grant writing types of arenas. Um, the children that really may not even know what they're even doing uh, because the mom or dad is acting a little different than they were before, um, and obviously it could lead to other things. If you could expound on that a little bit. Well, <clears throat> um, one of my roles, as Jim said, was I was uh, chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and my job was to you know, recruit candidates and raise money for them. Um, and I guess I was chosen for this job because of my good looks and personality. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you know, had nothing to do with my last name being Kennedy. And so I'd uh, often show up at these places and they'd say, well, when is the Kennedy going to get here? You know, when are Congressman Kennedy? So anyway, um, I would recruit candidates uh, along with Dick Gephardt at the time in 2000. One of the people we recruited was this wonderful teacher of the year in California, Aaron Gruel. And uh, she had taken this class of all, you know, the kids that were never destined to graduate and, um, in Orange County, California. And, and she said to the school, I'll teach these kids, but let me teach them all the way through high school, the same class all the way through high school. And all the kids graduated to the astoundment of all of those in the council and the school and everything else because it was the dropout rate, like a lot of inner city troubled school systems, was, you know, 40 percent or so. And um, anyway, uh, they wondered, well, how does she do it? Well, anyway, they made a movie about her, and it was called Freedom Writers. And she got them all to read about, you know, um, uh, the, the, you know, Anne Frank's book, and then got them all to write their own biographical stories about how hard they had their lives. And then they got to learn about school through their own journaling. Anyway, so uh, the point of the story, uh, to answer your question, was um, the, what she found was the ones that were all d destined, was all of them had parents who were in jail or troubled with the law and everything else. And they were all doomed like by statistics, 
until someone paid attention to them and loved them. I mean, she, you could just see this woman. She's an extraordinary teacher. Um, she's, you, she loved all of them, and you know, it, it's expressed in this movie. Uh, starred you know, Hilary Swank um, is the is the star um, in the movie. Anyway, so um, the idea behind this is that um, you know, I she's come to she came to Rhode Island about two months ago. We she was, she's doing this new education program. She put all of those same kids through college because of the movie. She was given the, the proceeds for her book because it was her story. And she used her proceeds to pay for all of them to go to college. So, I mean, this, she's the real thing. I mean, she you know, pays for all the, her own, these kids in there. So she considers them all her kids now. And, and anyway, um, she's got a teacher's academy now where she teaches other uh, teachers how to teach, you know, at-risk inner city youth. Um, so she came to, now I took her around not only my inner city in my district, but my suburbs. And you'd be surprised in suburbia, she goes, how many of you have, uh, you know, a friend who is a member of a gang? And, you know, a fourth of the class put their hands up. And I'm like, wait a second, this is East Providence. This is not downtown Providence or Pawtucket. And, uh, you know, and of course we went around and, you know, how many of you have a parent who has been in jail and, you know, three quarters of the hands in the high school go up? And how many of you have had your electricity shut off? And of course the whole place, their hands go in the air. And, um, and anyway, point taken. You know, of course we go out to the juvenile training school, which is where all the kids who are in the juvenile justice system are. She goes, how many of you, and, and there it's, Parents are actually in jail at the time, not just been in, the law, in jail before, but are actually at the time. So for most of their lives, for most of these kids. So it's not hard to understand how, you know, kids end up where they are. I mean, they're a product of their environment. And, um, you know, when we have cycles and cycles of generation, uh, generations of kids in trouble, it's you know, it's because we're letting the social fabric fall away. And that's why uh, President Obama was so great in his um, State of the Union speech to say, I want, you know, everybody to give a year of higher education. He was challenging America, too. We need to pull together because 35% dropout rate in our inner cities is, is what the norm is. That's the norm in this country, in case people don't realize. And Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls, Woonsocket, Newport, Rhode Island, 35% dropout rate is the dropout rate in Newport. The, the, the glitzy America's first resort with the big mansions, 35% dropout rate. And that is unsustainable. Detroit, Michigan is 45% dropout rate. LA, I'm sure it's about that. So, um, and you know, it's, what I'm saying is, you know, you have a, big challenge when a lot of people don't have stable homes and, um, and the kids don't have something that... I'm getting the uh, sign that it's time to draw this to a conclusion, to an end. I want to first of all thank uh, all of you uh, for being here tonight for your interest in this uh, compelling uh, topic. And I want to thank uh, Patrick for uh, his uh, leadership in Congress on these uh, important issues, for uh, carrying on the legacy of President Kennedy as he's done so extremely well, and for uh, your loyal friendship. Thank you very much. Let's give Patrick a round of applause. Thank you. Older cousin, Stephen Smith, right here. <laughs> <laughs>